Hello and welcome to part two of chapter three's lecture on microscopy and cell morphology. So in this half we're going to talk about um, the parts of the prokaryotic cell. We're going to look at bacteria and work our way from the outside to the inside looking at all of the different structures and uh, the function of each of those structures. So I'd like to start with just uh, first some general information about bacteria. First of all, bacteria come in three primary morphologies. If you're not sure what that means, the morphology means shape. So we have three basic shapes of bacteria. We have cocci or coccus, which are perfectly nice little spheres, nice little round guys. Think staphylococcus or streptococcus. Then we have bacillus. A bacillus is more often known as a rod. That's kind of the um, general term for it, simply because there is a genre of bacteria called bacillus, so it can be confusing. Uh, but we call them um, bacilli are known as rods. And then the last are the spirillum. And the spirillum are kind of a bit of like a corkscrew type look. They look uh, kind of like a curly tail. There are also three what we call primary arrangements. Arrangements are how the individual or planktonic bacterial cells interact with each other. Sometimes they like to pair off, and so they form these two pairs that you see here. And so this is referred to as a diplo. Um, then we have what's known as the staff arrangement. In the staff arrangement right here, they cluster together, think like a group of grapes. And then the last arrangement that we see is a strep arrangement, think strep throat, which is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. And uh, the strep arrangement is usually cocci, although we also see this in rods, in bacilli as well. And they line up end to end and create these big long chains of uh, bacterial cells. There are a few exceptions and some additional morphologies to bacteria. We have here what are called coxobacilli. Coxobacilli are rods that are really short and um, they're more of an oval shape. You can see they have kind of an oval shape as opposed to being perfectly round. And so this oval shape, they're actually a rod. They're actually a bacillus bacteria of more uh, morphologically in their morphology or shape, but they are sometimes mistaken for cocci under the microscope because they are so short. So when you look into the microscope and you see something that's kind of oval shaped and you're looking at it going, uh, I don't know, is that a rod? Is that a cocci? Nine times out of 10, it's what's called a coxibacilli. Uh, that um, particular morphology is kind of in between a true bacilli and a cocci. Then we have a spirochete. A spirochete is just an extreme form of a spirillum. Um, we looked at a spirochete when we were looking at syphilis in the dark field microscopy. Syphilis is a spirochete. Vibrio, as in uh, like Vibrio cholera, are very long rods that are bent and have this kind of half moon shape. And so this is referred to as a Vibrio shape. And so the bacteria that causes cholera has this Vibrio shape. So it's actually called Vibrio cholerae. And then down here, we have what's called a sarcina arrangement. And this is where a bunch of, this is usually within um, cocci. And these right here are sarcina. Um, this is actually a, a picture from a different bacteria, but the sarcina were part of it. So I just wanted to show you what they look like. So these sarcina here are where we have a whole bunch of cocci that line up and they usually form these little cubes and they will either be four or eight. So there'll be four of them together and then they'll put four more on top and it'll form a cube-like structure of eight different um, bacteria cells. Now, as far as cell structure goes, we are gonna work our way from the outside of the um, bacterial cell to the inside. And here we have a TEM, right? So this is transitional uh, transmission electron microscopy looking at the inside of the cell. And we are gonna talk about PLE, we're going to talk about um, the cell wall. Where is it down here? We're going to talk about the flagella that some bacteria have, not all. Um, we're also going to talk about a modified pili or pilus known as a fimbriae. Um, and then we'll start looking inside of the cell at the uh, cell membrane, the cell wall. We'll talk about the uh, cytoplasm, what, is, what makes up the cytoplasm, and of course the genetic material. So let's uh, take a look at the outside. So in the outside, these are external structures or appendages that we find on different bacteria. The first are the fimbriae and the pili. 
Fimbriae and Pili are both used for attachment, but Pili has a secondary function. So Fimbriae are these long tubes. So here I have my bacteria cell. And so these guys, they look like cilia, but bacteria do not have cilia. Um, they just have these kind of hair-like structures that are sticky, and they use these structures to stick to surfaces, to attach to things. Uh, and this becomes important in things like biofilm formation and pathogenicity. But sometimes some of these fimbriae will modify themselves, and they actually become a modified form of fimbriae called a pili or pilus or sexcolus. And the pilus elongates and it hollows out and it becomes this long hollow tube that is going to come into contact with another bacteria cell. We'll just put some fimbriae on this guy. And so what this guy's going to do is he's going to take a piece of genetic information um, called the plasmid. He's going to take some genetic material and he's going to pass that genetic material along that hollow tube into the neighboring cell and now the neighboring cell will get a copy of that plasmid of that genetic information. So the pili is used in a process known as conjugation. It's a form of gene exchange or genetic exchange between two bacterial cells. Um, it is what we call horizontal gene transfer. It's called horizontal because it does not result in offspring. I started out with two cells. I end with two cells. I didn't create any new cells. I just simply gave one cell a new characteristic by giving it new genetic information. So we'll go into um, more detail of conjugation and how that works in unit two. The next structure found on many bacteria are flagella. Now flagella we think of um, like in sperm. Uh, sperm are flagellated. Those are flagellated cells in the human body. But bacteria more often than not have multiple flagella. And the flagella are, they have the same function and, and um, uh, purpose in bacterial cells that we see in, in like sperm or other flagellated cells like flagellated protozoans. However, the structure of them is a little bit different and we will uh, go over the structure in a minute. The last are capsules. Capsules are protective sugar coats that are found on the outside of bacterial cells. The bacteria, in order to produce a capsule, have to have a gene for it, so not all bacteria are capable of capsule production. Uh, I call capsules kind of Harry Potter invisibility cloaks. And we'll go into more detail on those as well. So here's our flagella structure. And you can see here's flagella. This is what we call a peritrichous type of um, microorganism. E. coli is covered in flagella. It has lots of them. Uh, bacteria that are what we refer to as motile, meaning they have motility, will have flagella and fl uh, flagellated movement is how they work. The flagella has three components. It has a filament, a hook, and a basal body. The filament is composed of a protein called flagellin. This protein is bacteria specific. Uh, human cells and eukaryotic cells do not produce flagellin. This will become important when we look at um, immunology. Um, our immune system recognizes flagellin as foreign. So our um, immune system can tell that it's a bacterial cell that's present. So um, bacteria use a protein called flagellin to create the filament. The filament is attached to a structure called a hook. This hook allows for, uh, here's the hook here, it allows for rotation of the flagella. Uh, the flagellin protein and the composition of the flagella causes the, um, it causes the flagella to have a very stiff type of structure to it. I use the analogy of a cat's tail versus a dog's tail. So your cat can wave their entire tail and move it all around. It's very flexible and they twitch their tail at you and that sort of thing. So that's um, uh, flexibility within the entire filament. Bacteria have a filament that's more like a dog's tail. When a dog waves its tail, the whole tail moves. They can't um, just twitch just the end of their tail. So the tail is one long, uh, one long structure. So this filament, what the bacterial cells do is they rotate. So this filament is going to rotate and it'll turn clockwise and counterclockwise. And this creates movement called rolling and tumbling. That rolling and tumbling feature is um, when we see bacteria kind of spinning around under a microscope. I'll find a, um, I'll find a video for you on YouTube and I'll put that in the D2L course shell so you can see what motility looks like in bacteria. 
Now attached, the hook is really just kind of a structure for rotation, allows for that rotation uh, of the, the flagella for rolling and tumbling to occur. But it, energy is needed for this entire process. Plus we have to uh, anchor this, all of these flagella, they have to be anchored to the bacterial cell as well. So that anchoring is carried out by what's known as the basal body. You can see here that the basal body is um, underneath the outer lipid layer. This here is the cell wall. This structure right here is the cell wall. And the basal body is actually in the true cell membrane beneath that. This is a gram negative cell. And the cell wall uh, helps to anchor this here. You can see there are some proteins on either side of the bottom of the basal body. And that is because for energy, bacteria use an electron transport chain and produce energy for the flagella using the proton motive force. Uh, you may not know what that is right now. We're going to talk about that in chapter, I think in unit three, when we talk about metabolism, but it should be familiar to you from your anatomy classes. Capsules are external structures that are excreted by bacteria. Now in biology, we have a general term for an outer coating and that's called a glycocalyx. Uh, so glycocalyx in biology just means outer coating. There are different types of glycocalyx. There are protein glycocalyx, sugar glycocalyx, and what we call slime molds or um, uh, slime layer glycocalyx. And bacterium for the most part use the sugar one. So they are excreted by some, and this glycocalyx out here, this sugar coating referred to as a capsule, uh, aids in attachment. It's a little sticky, so it's sugar. So it uh, allows to, to the bacteria to attach more easily. Contributes to, uh, it's considered what we call a virulence factor. It contributes to the pathogenicity or the virulence of an infection by this bacteria simply because of this sugar coating. So here we have some bacteria that are stained. The background is this purple pink you see here. The bacterial cell itself is purple. I've just covered it up with red, but the purple. And then this clearing here, this white area that's surrounding all of these different cells, that's the actual capsule itself. This staining method stains the bacteria in the background, but does not stain the actual capsule. Here's another one right here. This one's much smaller, much harder to see. It's just a different staining method. But the idea is that we can see these actual capsules here, and you can see they're excreted on the outside of the cell. They aid in virulence because all of the signals that our immune system would use to recognize this bacteria as something foreign is now covered up by this glycocalyx, by this capsule. So these bacteria are still metabolically active. They can produce toxins. They can take in nutrients. They can carry out all of their normal activities. They just do so in this candy-like coating, this smooth outer sugar coating that our immune system can't get past in order to recognize the cell. An example of a um, capsule forming bacteria in virulins is Streptococcus. Streptococcus pyogenes is a capsule forming bacteria that causes strep throat. So think about how bad, how, um, how much it hurts when you have strep throat. All of that inflammation and pus formation, that is your immune system responding in a really potent, strong way. That's what all of that inflammation is. And it's doing that because it knows there's a pathogen there, but it can't get to it. So the pathogen continually signals that, inflama uh, that um, inflammatory signal and the immune system is responding to it, but it's not getting rid of the bacteria. Uh, these, this capsule also allows for immune system evasion. The immune system antibodies can't attach to these guys. Uh, phagocytosis, we have what's known as receptor mediated endocytosis from our phagocytic cells. They can't carry out those processes properly. The signals that would normally attach to these bacteria to signal phagocytosis and destruction are not going to be able to gain access. So it's considered um, a true virulence factor. It's also very organized. So a capsule is an organized glycocalyx. And if the glycocalyx is kind of slimy and very unorganized and more liquid-like, then it's called a slime layer. Uh, some water bacteria or aquatic bacteria will use slime layers, not capsules. And they'll use that for attachment and as a form of motility to kind of slide along uh, grass blades and other surfaces.
So you can see down here, here's a bacterial cell. The cell wall is in here, but this purple area is the slime layer on or um, a, a form of capsule on the bacteria itself. I call capsules uh, Harry Potter invisibility cloaks. If you like Harry Potter, uh, Harry Potter would put on that invisibility cloak and he could run around the castle and cause all kinds of trouble, but nobody could see him. And that's what the capsule is like on bacteria. These bacteria put on their little capsule invisibility cloak and they can run around the body and wreak all kinds of havoc and our immune system has trouble finding them because they're hiding in that, um, in that glycocalyx. So now that we have covered all of the external structures, attachments, um, all of those so sorts of parts of the bacteria, we're now going to start, uh, in the next lecture, start looking at some more internal structures. We'll start with the cell wall, and then we'll move our way in from there. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture on external structures, part of the cell morphology of bacteria, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day.